Welcome to the Virtual Center for the Study of the Constitution and Civic Responsibility, an ongoing inquiry into American political origins and evolving institutions. The executive director of the Virtual Center is Dr. Bill O'Brien. He's also your host for this continuing conversation. Here he is now, Dr. Bill O'Brien. Thank you, Bob Kincaid, and welcome. Welcome to the Virtual Center for the Study of the Constitution and Civic Responsibility. It is a Wednesday. Today is the 30th day of December in the year 2015. It is a pleasure uh, to be with you on this our third day of live broadcasting uh, for this week. Uh, and, uh, you know, it is kind of it is kind of uh, fulfilling in a way to uh, to get a full week's worth of broadcasting in. And uh, each week I say that, but I but I really mean it. Um, I did I did uh, in talking uh, in conversation last night, um, the person I was talking to made a comment that, uh, uh, you know, about the amount of time that was that I've been spending with John Locke. And uh, fact of the matter is, John Locke is incredibly important. And uh, he was important at the time in the 18th century. And I, in fact, I, now that I mentioned this, I think I think it may it's, it's, it's worthy of comment. He was very, very influential in his time, but he has become so influential since then because his theories, his philosophy, as it were, is the basis, is used as the basis for much that's going on of, 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 that is producing controversy in our contemporary society uh, related to the issue of free enterprise capitalism. And so I think it is absolutely important as we as we delve deeper and deeper into the political and economic system uh, and the connection between the politics and the economy of that system. I think it's very, very important. The more comfortable we can be with uh, John Locke, who really sowed the roots of 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 the system. Uh, in terms of the issue of property and the relationship between property, its owners, and government. I think these continue to, these issues are the ones which continue to produce controversy in our society today. And I think as much time uh, as we need to devote to, to them, I, I, th I think it's, it's time well spent. Um, I do uh, solicit <coughs> and encourage uh, uh, your participation in the program. Uh, we do have a phone number. Uh, I do encourage you to feel comfortable uh, picking up the phone and using it and sharing your thoughts and your ideas. Uh, you will recall that uh, we had a call from uh, uh, from uh, John, uh, I believe, on Monday, um, and uh, uh, from out west, and and uh, uh, you know it, it, the point that John made was was incredible. It was right on the mark. Um, and I think that, uh, uh, you know, I, I just worry sometimes that people feel a little bit uncomfortable. And I, I, I kind of blame myself for that in a way because I get, I get so wrapped up in this material sometimes that I know it, it's, a little, it's, it's almost intimidating to people if they even, even if they are inclined to call. So I don't want people to feel that way. And I want you to know that, uh, that I do solicit your calls. Um, and we can always we can always get back and cover whatever we're into later. Uh, but the point is that that if you are inclined or prompted to make a particular call, it's because there's an issue right there and then that needs to be addressed. And and, and that must take precedence. So please feel free to, to to call and share your thoughts and your ideas and questions, concerns, whatever, whatever you might have. We would love to hear from you. Our phone number is area code 304-663-467. Uh, excuse me. I, I, I messed up the phone number. And uh, 4673. I'm sorry. 363-4673. Uh, That's area code 304-363-4763. I'm, I'm sorry. I messed up the phone number. Um, I'll have to I'll have to do some checking. I've been doing it from memory for months, and I suddenly drew a blank there. Uh, but uh, anyway, um, also I would uh, I would encourage you to feel uh, comfortable if you're not 
if you don't feel comfortable calling, um, I do encourage you to drop me an email um, and, and share your thoughts with me that way. I would love to hear from you. My email address is waobrien906 at gmail.com. That's waobrien, O-B-R-I-E-N, 906 at gmail.com. And again, I do remind you that we do have a Facebook page. We've had it up now for, for the last three or four months. Um, the, if you go to Facebook and you type in the Virtual Center for the Study of the Constitution, you will be into our Facebook page. And there are a number of postings on there um, that I think are timely. They relate, for the most part, to issues uh, that we've dealt with or will be dealing with here at the Virtual Center. Last evening, for example, after our program closed late yesterday afternoon, I, uh, I sat down and put a, a, a short posting. It's one of, the, one of the shorter ones on Facebook that, I, that I've done. Uh, but it related to one particular aspect of our program yesterday that I thought was particularly significant. I wanted to get it in print because I wanted to kind of establish it as a as a key concept or a key principle uh, that came up uh, as a result of our careful attention uh, to these sources. And you'll recall that in the reading of John Locke, and this is really the basis of the Facebook posting, I quoted one particular sentence from Locke that we dealt with yesterday. And that sentence is as follows, quote, we see in commons which remains so by compact that it is the taking any part of what is common and removing it out of the state nature leaves it in that begins the property without which the common is of no use. And I made particular mention of the four words which begins the property. And the implication there, we dealt with this some time ago here at the Virtual Center, and I wanted to really flag this and reinforce it because it seems to me so significant. And that is the transition that takes place in the nature of property once property is claimed to be owned by somebody. In other words, once, once someone appropriates a portion of the commons, as his own. And as Locke points out, the way you do that is by mixing your labor with it. Once you do that, and, and, and theref thereby appropriate it as your own, that's the point at which property as property comes into existence. In other words, the process of privatizing it, of taking ownership of it, transposes the nature uh, transposes its nature in the process. Property as property doesn't exist so long as it's part of the commons, Locke's, Locke believes, because it's owned by everybody, it's available to everybody. It becomes property, it becomes an entity It becomes, and the word I think of, of relevance here is alienable. It becomes alienable, an entity in and of itself, when it is privatized. When it is removed from the commons and taken ownership, and some, someone takes ownership of it. Once it is, becomes private property, then it becomes alienable. And what that means is, as the property owner, you can fence it in, you can harvest it, you can timber it, you can pursue uh, uh, mineral wealth on it, you can sell it, you can leave it to your heirs. In other words, it becomes a legal entity, if you will. It becomes a, a you know, it, it changes uh, its nature from when it was part of the commons. And the reason that that is significant, and I think this is probably the third time 
uh, that, that I've dealt with this, but I believe it's so important, is because of Jefferson's Declaration of Independence and his use of the term unalienable rights. The whole idea of unalienable rights means that these are rights that cannot be taken or given away. They are yours as a result of the fact that you are alive, that you are a human being. They come from the creator, Jefferson says. And therefore, they cannot be taken away. They cannot be interfered with or compromised in any way because they are unalienable. But by, by definition, once property becomes alienable, then it ceases to be unalienable. And so when Locke talks about property within the state of nature as one of man's natural rights, he talks in the state of nature about man's natural rights to life, liberty, and property. In that context, property is unalienable. And the reason it's unalienable is because it is available to everyone. And what, and, and what that means is it is, as, a, as portion, as part of the commons, it is potential. It has the potential to become owned, to be owned by somebody else, to be privatized, to be appropriated or to be claimed. And so as long as it exists as, pro as, as potential, it's unalienable. Because to interfere with its potentiality would be to deny people's freedom to claim it, if that makes sense. In other words, it's as potential property that it is unalienable. Because it is potential it is potentially property. Once it is claimed, once it is appropriated, it becomes alienable. At that point, it becomes an entity. It becomes an item. It becomes a thing. It can be, it can be, uh, a value can be placed upon it. It can be fenced in. It can be inherited. It can be taxed uh, by government if there is a government. It can be, um, you know, it, it, it can be uh, marketed, it can be timbered, it can be uh, uh, harvested, it, you know, whatever. The point is the nature of the item itself changes in the transition from the state of nature to organized society under the social contract. And what that means is that all of those people in today's world who claim the sanctity of private property and seek to claim it as unalienable, as beyond government's right to regulate or control or manage, those who rely on John Locke for, the, for justification for that argument are wrong. Because John Locke himself points out that the process of becoming property constitutes a significant change in status. Let me share with you, and we, had, we haven't gone this far yet, but we, we will be going there today. A couple of paragraphs removed, a couple of paragraphs further into the chapter, Locke once again reinforces this idea of the transition to becoming property. He says in paragraph number 31, it will perhaps be objected to this, that if gathering the acorns or other fruits of the earth, etc., makes a right to them, that anyone may engross as much as he will, to which I answer not so. And we, we focused a little bit of time on this yesterday because what Locke is talking about here is if people can appropriate property from the commons and claim it as their own, then Locke says one would naturally assume that one could appro appropriate, could take as much, not as he needed, but as he wanted. 
And Locke says, not so. The same law of nature that does by this means give us property does also bound that property to, uh, to also. Let me, let me repeat that sentence. The law, the same law of nature that does by this means give us property. So what, what Locke is saying is the same thing he said earlier, namely that when, that it is the state of nature that gives us property. It doesn't exist until somebody takes it. And the same rules, reason, which provides the property, also limits it to what man can use and no more. So Locke makes a very, very definitive statement that you are not entitled to take as much as you will, as much as you want, but only as much as you need. And then, of course, as we know, come the qualifications of that claiming of privatization, that claiming of your own property, namely that it can only be as much as you can use. You can't claim property that might spoil or rot or whatever. And you must, in the claiming of your property, there must be, what Locke says, there must be enough and as good left for others. In other words, your taking of that portion of the commons must not negatively impact other people. If it, do, if it does, then that basically raises the question that reason that your claiming of that particular portion of the commons would become unreasonable. And so I think that is particularly, particularly significant. Um, I, I wanted to get back, and that, that's really the paragraph, it seems to me, where we stopped, where we stopped yesterday. So I think we're uh, we're, we're right in tune um, that basically Locke is denying people the right to take more property than they can use, to accumulate property for the sake of accumulating it. And Locke goes into great detail, and we'll see this in a moment, Locke goes into great detail on the extent to which it's man's labor that gives property value. And so, therefore, Locke argue, argues, it's not reasonable for people to take property, more property than they need, and let it just sit there of no use to anyone. The only reason that property would be appropriated, Locke believes, is to enhance its value, enhance its ability to contribute to the, to, to the welfare of other people. And so taking huge portions of property, fencing them in, claiming them as your own, and just letting them sit there, Locke argues, does not make sense. It's not reasonable. It's not logical. So therefore, he denies man the right to do that. So he says, the same law of nature that does by this means give us property does also bound that property too. In other words, it limits the amount of it. God has given us all things richly, Locke says. But how far has he given it us to enjoy? As much as anyone can make use of to any advantage of life before it spoils, so much he may by his labor fix a property in. Whatever is beyond this is more than his share and belongs to others. Nothing was made by God for man to spoil or to destroy. 
And so basically, Locke is applying common sense logic to the situation in the state of nature which produces private property, the, the right to private ownership. And basically, always, and I think, I think that this is the key to the whole thing, always, Locke is insistent that the rights of the individual must be weighed against the good of the, of the, of the rest, of the other people, of the community, although he doesn't use community. Because when you talk about community, you are implying some sort of organized group uh, that live in a particular place. And, of course, the state of nature seemingly, seemingly is populated by individuals. So there's no community as such. But, in fact, Locke's consideration about the rights of other people always taking precedence to the rights of any one individual seem to be very, very significant here. Locke goes on, let me finish that paragraph. Locke goes on and says, and thus considering the, na the plenty of nature, natural provisions, there was a long time in the world and the few spenders. And to how small a part of that provision the industry of one man could extend itself and engross it to the prejudice of others, especially keeping within the bounds set by reason of what might serve for his own use. There could be then little room for quarrels or contention about property so established. What he's saying is that in the beginning, when the world wasn't seemingly overpopulated, as it were, as it were there was plenty there for everybody. And if you took a portion and claimed it to be your own and mixed it with your labor, then there was really no room, he said, little room for quarrels and contention. There was no reason for people to complain because there was plenty left for them. And so therefore, your taking of private, your taking of private property didn't really negatively impact anyone. Hey, Dr. Bill? Yes, yes, Bob. May I ask a question? You please do. I'd, I'd love it. Uh, given the given the temporal context in which Locke writes what he writes, mm -hmm. what is uh, what is uh, what impact does the presence of indigenous peoples have on all of his theorizing? Um. In, in, in this particular, Bob, in this particular portion, he doesn't even acknowledge the existence of indigenous people. That was what I thought. He, he, he talks about commoners. He makes specific reference to commoners. And these are the people who survive on the commons, who basically exist within the, within the, the world that God created for them. Is, but make, I, is but he, make no is, effort to privatize. Is he is he writing within a European context, or given the fact that the the colonization of the New World was well under the, underway by the time he was writing, right? Uh, is is this uh, is is the, and let me let me back up and maybe see if I can hash out a little bit of sense out of where I'm trying to go with this. By the time I think by the time that uh, that, that Locke was writing. Uh, the evolution had already begun to tra take place, that the New World was this vast, empty place mm -hmm. that was ripe for uh, colonization, development, Ex exploitation. Exploitation, yes. And, I mean, I, I, I'm, I'm just want, because if you want to get right down to it, the best argument for Locke's uh, community notions are to be found in the indigenous peoples of the Americas. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes. And uh, because because they did hold in common. Right. Right. And 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 they found ideas of of, of earth ownership uh, not only unfathomable but outlandish, ridiculous, ludicrous. Right. How can how can a creature that lives maybe 70 years 
own something that has always been and always will be. I, I, I think, Bob, I, first of all, uh, Locke does mention more than once uh, the Americas. And, and he's writing within, he's obviously writing within England, uh, in, from England, in England. He's obviously writing from a perspective of civilization, and his considerations of America are that America is the closest thing to a state of nature that we still have left. In other words, he uses America as, 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 as an explanation to people as what the state of nature that he is, he is speculating, that he is imagining, would be like. So he doesn't talk about indigenous peoples there either. The fact of the matter is, I don't, I don't know this to be true, but I, I'm, I'm almost certain that Locke never went to the New World, although he was directly involved in writing the Constitution for the colony of South Carolina, I believe. But uh, um, can you see? Can you see where I might think this oh. just the teensiest bit disturbing? Oh yeah. Oh, I, I no, I do too. I do too. But, but, um, well, go, elaborate a little bit on that, Bob. I mean, you know, I mean, I, I think I know what you mean, but I'd like to hear. I'd like to hear it. Well, if, 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 as I understand Locke, and you have read him more deeply than have I, and hence the reason I asked this question. But if I understand what I have read and what I have heard from you and learned from you then it would seem to be the height of, of hypocrisy uh, to support any sort of colonization effort. Because, uh, because, because the very act of whether it be the Massachusetts Bay Colony or the Jamestown, uh, the Jamestown Company, mm-hmm. those, are, those are, at least, are commercial or semi-commercial at best enterprises. Right. No one came to the New World, despite all of our posturing about religious freedom and whatnot. Nobody came to the New World to live in a state of nature. They came to impose European standards, European values, European culture, hell, even European agriculture and European uh, 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 botany Right. on the New World. Right. I agree. I agree. 100%. There's no. There is no way that. And and, and I mean this. I'm not. Criti- I'm, I, I don't want to. I don't want to come across as, as criticizing the ideas. But it seems. It seems like inherent in all of this. There's a certain amount of physician heal thyself. Bob, you know, um, I, I think, and and I don't know whether this will will will. And, help and, and I hope I, I hope I'm I hope I'm not being a thorn in your side. No, you're not, not at all. And on the contrary, I think I think the point you're raising is a good one because what you're pointing to is the fact that Locke did not write this this entire these these treatises in a vacuum. He had a, his there was a political agenda here. And the political agenda was to basically justify the emergence of the middle class and the restructuring of government in England to fit the needs and the priorities of that middle class. And that middle class was a business group. It was a group of investors. Uh, These were the people that were investing in colonization. These are the people that were coming over here for purposes of wealth and, and all the rest of it. And what Locke basically, it seems to me what Locke is doing is within that context, he's working, uh, trying to work out a theory which, which justifies the priorities of this new capitalism in the face of the, of the, the people who are not directly involved in it. But it does, he's not talking about indigenous peoples in the new world because they, they were, I, it seems to me from everything that I've read, the English looked upon the Native Americans as, as, as a hindrance, as a, as a problem they had to deal with, and they tried various strategies to deal with them. One was eliminating them. One was, try, uh, was demanding that they be integrated uh, and that they, uh, that they surrender their way of life and their culture and all the rest of it. The other is that they be pushed west, and other is that they be encircled. Uh, 
you know, in, in, in kind of, in, you know, encampments or whatever. I mean, it, but it seems to me that that in, in, you know, at no time with possible with a few exceptions. And I've, I've got one in mind specifically. Did people consider the value of the cultures of the civilization, the, the, the peoples, the indigenous peoples that were already there? In other words, there was a general acceptance of the fact that this is that this is civilization and civilization must move and must expand. And that's what we're doing. We're part of the future. We're part of the progress, uh, the progress of mankind. And that's what they believed they were. And so I don't think within that framework there was any room for consideration of the indigenous peoples or whatever, except that the indigenous peoples and bringing the word of God to them was a way to justify what they were doing to those that might question. But beyond that, I don't really think that there was any serious consideration about the welfare of the indigenous peoples. But, you know, and, and, and again, I think you're right. I think that the, the idea of community um, uh, could, could best be played out by, by looking at the, 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 the cultures and the way of life that the, that the people in these areas uh, lived. But I don't, I don't believe, you know, I, I just believe that Locke's primary concern was to justify the privatization and the, the objectives of, 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 of ownership and capitalism within the existing world that, you know, within which, within which it was developing. Yeah, within that framework. Right. And what he's trying to do is balance the the and basically suggesting that what we're doing is bringing value to the land that we uh, that 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 is appropriated and we're doing it in a way which doesn't in any way negatively impact anybody else and and his justification for that is that there's so much land in the world that is just lying there waiting to be developed and he uses the Americas as an example of that. But that, but that in itself is a is a false premise, is it not? Well, um, uh, yeah. I mean, I, I think I think it is. I mean, I think it's all driven by the same set of assumptions. If you don't question the assumptions, everything he's saying makes perfect sense. If you question the 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 assumptions that he makes about the the right to this and all of that and. And the idea that God made it available to us and God told us to subdue it and God told us to basically bring value to it by mixing our labor with it and all of that. That's what he's that's what he's basically talking about. He's not you know, he's he's basically I, I think if you get into the colonial situation, uh, the companies that are driving colonialism, I think he would probably say that what these people are doing are, are bringing the ingredients which will create the the development that you know and the uh, you, know, you know the availability of the opportunities for future peoples or whatever. But the indigenous peoples there, they could either join us or get out of the way. But their their rights, I mean, as such, didn't exist. And and I know elsewhere in Locke's second thesis thesis uh, uh, treatise rather. Um, there's a question about the issue of, of, of natural rights, because in, in effect, and Locke says this, that if you look at the natural rights to life, liberty, and property, when you really look at them, all of it comes down to property. And his point is your life is, is property. Your life is property that, you know, that, that, that God makes available to you. Um, uh, and your freedom is the freedom to pursue property. And so basically all of this, you know, so Locke says it all comes down to the issue of property. And that raises the question, what about the people that don't own property? What rights do they have? And Locke's answer to that is that they have the right to pursue it, that they have the right to breathe God's air, to re breathe God's air and the freedom to move around with the ultimate objective of securing property for themselves. And that's all the freedom they have. They don't have rights. Their rights are the natural right to pursue property. And that's and that's it. 
so yeah, I mean that that that's very disturbing when you when you think about it. I, that's, I mean, well, yeah, because because there's there's a lot in the commu- in the notions of community uh, to like. Uh, yeah. The 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 well, more the more capitalist aspects are where I begin to get a little case of the willies. Oh, I know. No, I, mean, uh, I do as well, Bob. And then you know when I, when I real it, when it, when it dawned on me that um, that this is all being said in the uh, against the backdrop of literally millions of human beings who are being overrun, displaced, and killed. Right. For that land. Well, I, I don't, I don't, I don't know, I don't know what it, I don't know what it does to the, I don't know what it does to the theory of property, but I know what it does to my sense of morality. Yeah, yeah. My sense of ethics. Oh yeah, no, it, 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 it disturbs me too. And um, what, what I'm, what I'm suggesting, and and the whole ration, my whole rationale here, in in dealing with this, is because. T- the, today's people of wealth and influence justify everything they do from Locke. And the fact of the matter is, even if you read Locke, you begin to realize that the things that, that today's people who would use Locke as justification for what they are doing and what they want to do, um, even Locke doesn't go that far. In, in other words, Locke never for a moment uh, ignores the limitations on, on, on private property and, and the need to make sure that there's enough for other people and the need to, to, so that people don't take more than they need and, 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 and all of these things. He's very, very conscious. So in effect, um, and this is me talking, I, I, didn't, I didn't pick this because Locke doesn't say this. I'm saying that, in effect, the existence of something that we call community is always in Locke's mind because he's always got to justify uh, what he wants to do in the context of how it's going to be received, how it's going to be perceived by other people who are not directly involved in this at the, at, at the moment. And his idea is that there's so much of the world available, there's so much of the of of God's world available, that nothing that anybody does is going to negatively impact everybody else. It doesn't. In other words, it doesn't impinge on anybody's opportunity. And the implication is the opportunity is there for other people to pursue their own self interests as well, and that's what really drives the drives the process. And I, I really believe, and, and you know, and we were talking earlier about this uh, issue of, the, of Lincoln and the Civil War. I really believe that that, that th- the assumptions which drive that belief are, y- you know, are critical in, uh, you know, in the expansion. For example, the, the, the debate over expansion of, of slavery into the territories at that time. I think that the reason that the expansion of slavery was so negative in Lincoln's mind and others is because wherever slavery went, free labor couldn't go. In other words, it limited opportunity. The very existence of slavery denied op- denied the reality of opportunity. So what that meant was that wherever slavery was, free enterprise could not go. And that, that, that meant that you were pl- putting limits on opportunity, which in theory needed to be limitless, if that, ma- if that makes any sense. But, but uh, and I well, really... Well, it does, do- and, I, and I hope I didn't take you too far afield. No, you didn't, not at all. I think this is very important. And I, I mean, I, I, I think, it, you know, because sometimes you can become so, you become so caught up in luck that you buy, you're buying into his assumptions and you don't even recognize that you're doing it. I mean, I don't think for a moment that it's beneficial at all to to lose sight of the fact that Locke is writing in a very distinctly political situation. He has political objectives. He's justifying. He's writing to justify the the rights of those that are in the forefront of a whole new way of life that is beginning to emerge in England at this time in the late in the late 17th century. 
and the polit the politics that he lays out, which is the you know which is the idea of natural rights and limited government and all the rest of it. His basic premise is that the people who are in the forefront of this development movement, which is what we call capitalism, need to be involved in making the political rules under which they they are forced to operate. In other words, his argument, it, it, it Locke's th uh, thinking is that it is entirely incongruous, incongruous for to assume that people can do business and pursue such an important uh, uh, duty for mankind, as you will, which is which is the development of of unde of an under under undeveloped world, and not have some role to play in the rules under which that development must take place. And so the argument is that the, the idea of absolute government, the idea that the power of the king and those that support him is absolute and they make all the rules and everybody else must abide by them and live within them, um, is, is not, it, doesn't make, it doesn't make sense. So what Locke is arguing is that these people need to be involved and what they have done politically in England is they have taken control of Parliament. And so Locke's whole second treatise on civil government is an effort to justify the right of Parliament to dictate the future for England. And, and the role of the king from that point on is, is, is rather uh, uh, ceremonial. You know that that in other words, that's the point at which the king's absolute the absolute power of the king is successfully challenged, and when King James the Second is driven from England, and the crown Parliament takes takes over in 1689, and offers the crown to William and Mary, and William of Orange comes back to England, and and agrees to accept the crown under the terms dictated by Parliament, which is the Bill of Rights of 1689, the English Bill of Rights of 1689. And what that does is establish the right of Parliament to design, to draw up the rules, to make the rules uh, for, you know, for government from that point on. And, the, and it renders the king's role rather ceremonial and not significant. And you know, and 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 you know, and and of course, from that point on, there were all of these struggles because the 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 the, the crown doesn't doesn't accept this. And when uh, I think at the at the very turn of the 18th century, uh, you, the end of the 17th and the beginning of the 18th century, uh, in, in the reign of I believe it's Queen Anne, um, there's serious questioning about the the insignificant role that has been allocated for the crown and so from that point on the crown through the early 18th century is making an effort to manipulate British politics English politics in order to reestablish some clout for the crown and that's that's what happens in the 18th century with the administration of Walpole and the South Sea bubble and, and all of this thing that ultimately there's a there's a meeting of the ways if you will between between the crown and 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 business uh, uh, in, in the 18th century, which produces the, the so-called South Sea bubble. But so I think all of this is important because this is the context that John Locke is writing in, Bob. And, 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 and that's his agenda. And I, I think it's very important that, that we not lose sight of that. You can get so deeply embedded into his philosophy that you lose sight of the fact that his philosophy, all of it has a political purpose. It's written within a within a very, very definitive political context. And to, and, and to that extent, I guess, maybe uh, what we, would moder we moderns would recognize as human rights takes a back seat. Yeah, and, and, that's, and that's the other thing, is people assume that with the Glorious Revolution and the English Bill of Rights of 1689, that that establishes representative democracy in England. It doesn't. It establishes the right of Parliament to participate in decision making, but it has it doesn't do anything for the people of England. You know, I mean, basically, Parliament is considered to be the elite. Uh, th this is the 
you know that uh, you know this is the, the, these are the people that represent the powers, uh, the people with power and influence in England, and so the Glorious Revolution, so-called, gives them the right to participate in decision making, but it doesn't do anything for the for the average common people in England, and so that that doesn't come until the early 19th century, but. Uh, the, you know, and and so uh, you know, in, in a sense, I think what what makes Locke so significant to us is this linkage, this link between Locke and Jefferson, and and the the assumption, or the idea that Jefferson's situation in trying to justify independence from Great Britain is very very similar to the situation that Locke writes in, and so therefore Locke's philosophy, Locke's second treatise becomes very valuable to Jefferson, very valuable as in, in, in order to lay out the justification for the independence of the American colonies. There, there's absolutely no question that, that, that that's true. And, you know. You know, you know what, Dr. Bill, let me, let me just say that moments like this, um, moments, moments like this, sort of remind me and reinforce the value of what happens here. Uh, because I, I dare say this is another one of those moments where I am almost 100%, I am, I am 100% certain that nothing even remotely resembling this conversation mm -hmm. and the information you particularly are putting forth is taking place anywhere anywhere well, in the I, broadcast universe of the United States of America today, yesterday, tomorrow, or any time in the near future, frankly. Now, you, there, there, there are innumerable places where you can turn to find out uh, uh, who said what about whom or how big Kim Kardashian's posterior is. But this, this information, so vital to understanding, uh, what we're doing in this hand basket and why it keeps getting warmer the, 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 the further along we go, this ain't out there. No. And, I, and I, it, I agree with you. It may feel a little bit sometimes, Bill, like, like being a lone voice crying in the wilderness. Mm -hmm. But, well, <laughs> sometimes, sometimes, sometimes one has to do the crying in the wilderness. I know. Because, uh, because the the crowded spaces are already lost i you know uh, that's but the, uh, one of the one of the things that 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 i think and and i'm i'm going to say this when, when the the fact that you've joined the conversation and the fact that you have asked the kinds of questions that bring out these considerations um and and the, and these the, you know the, these additional things i think is so important because i I, I don't, I'm not doing it, obviously. I mean, I, you know, I mean, in theory, I, I can say to myself, I should have, when, when I, when, when I th put together today's program, I should have gone into a lot of this so that Bob's question was really not necessary. But the fact of the matter is, there's no way to do that. And, and, and so therefore, it's, it's the interaction and you're asking questions and me answering them and you developing additional questions uh, based on on my answers to the que to the questions if I can if I can answer them that's what really gets us deeper and deeper into this and I, I think you're right I think I, I, I not only the information when you talk about this is the only place that this kind of information is out there Bob what has to happen is the discussion is the dialogue and that's what's not happening that's where oh, that, ab absolutely and, and 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 this really does not it, this doesn't fit within a classroom format either does it not really not really i mean I, I, ideally in theory it does i mean the the but in practice in, in theory the ideal class is that you have 25 or 30 people all of them engaged in this conversation all you know all of them you know trying to talk at the same time and and you, you're trying to moderate and say you know raise your hand so that everybody can hear and all that um, but the fact of the matter is the typical classroom is is you know and and I could I, I think I can say this you know pretty I'm pretty certain of this that there are very few class I mean the the, the 
exceptional class is the a class is the one where you get participation by more than two or three people. You know, if you get if you get a situation where a number of people participate, um, it's considered to be, uh, you know, you know, a, 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 a breakthrough. So the fact of the matter is everybody talks about the need for the classroom experience uh, and, and the, the, the interactive experience because learning happens in groups. But the fact of the matter is 95% of the learners don't participate actively in the discussion. And that's the reality. But, the, in, it, it's, but even if only two people are participating in the discussion, if you are if you are listening to or or witness to the discussion, then there's there's distinct learning possible because by definitions dialogue and discussion is interesting because the different the different points of view coming together uh, create interest. And Absolutely, learn, and, and and if people I, learn from it. And and if I may note, Bill, before I before I uh, stop uh, hogging the program. Um, there's a corollary to this that extends and becomes vitally important in our immediate present. I, I think I think about our own Appalachia here. Right. We are, you know, we we are we are witnessing, uh, even now, even still, with the collapse of the coal industry, uh, vast swaths of West Virginia and vast chunks of Kentucky and Southwest Virginia as well, and Northeast Tennessee, are owned by coal companies. Right. Or not coal companies, but land companies who are separate entities. All they do is sit around and hold land right. that could be otherwise put to decent use by people of curiosity, creativity, and desire. Right. And in and and in the in within, if I understand correctly, within the scope of what uh, what Locke puts forward, well, uh, that would be the right thing to do. That would be the right thing to do if it just didn't sit there. Yeah. And I think I think this is this is where I have a problem with Locke is because he he basically is presenting this whole this whole theory about property um, as if once we move into the phase where the accumulation of more property than one needs becomes acceptable to Locke. Because primarily with the with the introduction of money, that ultimately what he what he points out is it's possible for people to to accumulate more property than they need, because the, what they're going to do is sell off the excess to other people who'll develop it. Now that's a that's an assumption, and and uh, the fact of the matter is it's very clear that the, that his assumptions aren't necessarily true. That, well, as, well, you, can, as, can as you point out, people are sitting on huge piles of land. I, Bob, yes, I mean, this, I, this has occurred to me three or four times over the last couple of days. In, in, uh, in Sunday's, I believe it was Sunday's New York Times, either, it was either that or the Washington Post, I can't remember which, there was a story in there about California, and more, more particularly it was about Governor Brown. And there was a picture, and this is this is my point. The, the, at the at the beginning of the story, there was a picture of Governor Brown walking on his land in California. His his his, I I I, I don't think you can call it a farm. I don't know what you'd call it, Bob. It's twenty five hundred acres. I'm sure he calls it a farm for tax purposes. Twenty five hundred acres of land in California. And I said, my God, that land per acre must be worth a fortune. I had no idea. But I thought it, it, it showed him. And, and, and actually, I, I kind of like some of the things he's done as governor, so I'm not criticizing him necessarily. But the fact that he's out there, and it was obviously he was, you know, he was doing what we all do on a Sunday afternoon. I mean, some some of us take a drive into the, you know, take a drive into the mountains or something or take a drive into the country. He was taking a walk on his land. And it was this gorgeous landscape in the back, in the background. And when I saw 2,530 some odd acres or something, I thought, my God almighty, that's immense. 
you know, and 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 of course, I'm right in the middle of John Locke while I'm doing this. And I look at that picture and I said, oh, my God, Locke didn't anticipate this. I mean, all of that land out there that people could be farming and living on. And, you know, and I mean, people, are, you know, families are doubled up and tripled up in some of our cities and 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 three and four generations of the same family are living in the same, you know, crowded quarters and all of this and here he's walking on 2500 acres of land that's in my god but you're right i mean i mean it, well, it uh, uh, and 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 if i may just to just to round out the last couple of minutes of the hour and then i promise i'll give you your show back oh that's okay you're, you're I'd, I'd like to, i'd like to just lay out with a little more specificity what i mean when i say that there's land laying around okay. and then and then you you brought it all full circle when you said yes as long as something gets done to improve it right well, the, the life cycle of a mountaintop removal site, and remember, the amount of mountaintop removal that has been done in Appalachia is equal to the land area of the state of Delaware. Okay. All right, so that will yep. give you some degree, some, some idea of perspective, some scope. Right. Mm-hmm. Now, all of those mountaintop removal sites were required to be re, uh, reclaimed within the definitions set forth in uh, the Surface Mine Control and Reclamation Act, referred to as SMACRA, signed into law by Jimmy Carter in 1977. Mm -hmm. Less than 5% of a land area the size of the state of Delaware has been reclaimed within the meaning of that law. Okay. Now, that's uh, that's stunning. So that means 95% has not. Right. Yeah. But once they're done, the, the, the way the business works is the land company owns the land. The land company sells the coal, the estimated coal under the land to the coal company, which the coal company then expends capital extracting. Mm-hmm. And then they're supposed to reclaim the land. And then it, it was only leased. It was never sold to the coal company. So it reverts to the land company. So they still own that land. Mm-hmm. All right. All right. Now, it is absolutely useless for anything. Mm-hmm. Uh, in, in fact, uh, within Lockean terms, they have not only not improved it, they have actively diminished it. Right. And within geologic terms, they have done so permanently. Right. Um, uh, one one uh, conservative estimate of how long it will take a ma- mountaintop removal site uh, to come back to being an actual integral functioning part of nature is 100,000 years. Okay. Now, okay. are there things that could be done with that land? Uh, uh, some, have, some, some have tried growing apple trees on them. Well, mm-hmm. uh, you can't grow much of anything there except scrub grass that never grew because it's a mess. Yeah. Uh, all that'll grow are non-native grasses, and them not for very long. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, some people have said, "Well, you know, let's put some beehives on it." Yeah, okay, well, I'm not going to eat the honey that comes off a mountaintop yeah. removal site because I know the toxins involved. Right. But here's an idea. And and by the way, you can't put wind turbines on them anymore because they've taken the mountain down out of the range of the industrial class. Right. wind uh, currents right so yeah so you've lost the value of the wind and on top of that the ground is so screwed up by having just been backstacked or whatever that those giant industrial wind turbine standards mm-hmm. that hold up the turbines into the uh, they they'd, they'd wind up tipping over yeah uh, you'd, you'd have the leaning wind farm of uh, of dorothy mm-hmm <laughs> so the one thing you know the one thing that occurs to me is all right how about a solar farm how about how about the uh, how about if the, in, the the surface area of the state of Delaware becomes a, a solar farm mm-hmm. to provide electricity to the communities that have been otherwise robbed mm-hmm. of the value of the land because within this Lockean framework, you know, he, 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 wants, he wants people to, he wants improvement done. He, he, wants, he wants value added, and that's the term we use now, right? Right. Yeah, that is. Um, 
but what happens what happens when the usage you're putting to your land reduces the value of someone else's right and none of those questions are ever answered except for the fact that we acknowledge that that is the externalization of uh, to the com of the cost to the commons of these practices right so you know the, the uh, you can't drill a well the water table's gone what but uh, and and this is a question because I don't know but the land companies that own this land and and the the title to the land reverts to them when the coal companies have finished with it whatever the hell that means um what what is is there any anticipated future of um, in other words, what do these companies intend or plan to do with this land? What can they do if there's nothing you can do on it? Uh, nothing. I mean, every so now it, and then, every now and then they'll stick a for sale sign on it with some uh, ridiculously inflated price on it. Because we have these. I mean, th- but what but what, what what they do what they do is they become uh, in the in the complicated scheme of taxation, they become a loss leader. Yeah. Okay, so understand if a land company has land that has coal under it, unmined, unmined coal, uh-huh. they pay less in taxes on their property taxes for a thousand acres than I pay for my one acre with a crummy falling down eighty year old house on it. I see. So it just becomes it 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 becomes part of a wealth balancing act. Right. 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 But all of it, I mean, uh, and the re- reality of it all is that it's all short term because ultimately the land is going to end up to be totally useless to anybody. Right. And, and, and not only useless, but an active nuisance to the, to the, to the property owners around right. it. Well, I mean, you know, and I'm thinking of, you know, of course, the advertising that these companies provide about this reclaimed land is all these beautiful glassy, uh, grassy hills and, and all of this. I, I think the, uh, I, am I wrong or is a, a, a large part of the summit Boy Scout camp in, in, Apple, in uh, Fayette County, isn't, isn't that reclaimed land? Yes, it is. Some of the, yeah. I but it's, so. it's, it's old, yeah, it's old strip mine sites and I think there's probably some underground works there as well. Yeah, uh, but not necessarily. You know, it, it wasn't necessarily full scale mountaintop removal. Mm-hmm. To see that, you need to see something. And 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 I really should. I should take you down there sometime. You need to see Caford Mountain for yourself. Okay. Well, I'm, I'm, I've watched uh, flying into Charleston, depending on what. Yeah. Okay. Route. So yeah, yeah. I mean, you see, I mean, it's just incredible. And I can remember flying into Charleston uh, about a year ago, and people. It was very small. Obviously, a very small plane. People were running back and forth from one side of the aisle to the other, looking out the windows because they couldn't believe what they were seeing. And see, in that in that summit Bechtel uh, uh, example you gave, right. let's let's consider for a moment how that works for the land company. They donate the land, so that means that they they get to put a premium fair market value on it, mm-hmm. in terms of writing it off their taxes. Right. And it wasn't anything to them in the first place. Mm-hmm. Uh, they got it. They they got a potential liability off their hands. Right. So so they not only got a tax write up, but they got rid of it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know. Yeah. Uh, it's 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 a beautiful dodge. Yeah. Uh, it, it it. But Bob, they write the they write the tax laws. Well, to, sure they do. To, to suit those circumstances. Oh yeah, absolutely. Exactly. Yeah. Absolutely. But, so, but um, and all the things we're talking about are things that Locke doesn't consider. Now, the fact of the matter is, should he been able, should he have been able to foresee what the long-term implications of what he was proposing are? At, at the very, uh, and, and while we're into this, I know we'll be on the top of the hour, but we'll take a break in a moment. Let me, because uh, I don't want to lose this point. The very last paragraph of of this particular chapter in Locke. Um, and, 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 you know, I, I, I was going to I, I wanted to address it. And um, he said, Bobby says this. He says, but since gold and silver being little useful to the life of man in proportion to food, raiment and carriage has its value only from the consent of men, whereof labor yet makes in great part the measure. It is plain that men have agreed to a disproportionate and unequal possession of the earth. They having, by a tacit and voluntary consent, found out a way how a man may fairly possess 
more land than he himself can use the product of by receiving in exchange for the overplus gold and silver, which may be hoarded up without injury to anyone. And so basically, that's the point at which, that's the, the, effectively the last paragraph in, in his fifth chapter. But he has effectively ended the discussion with the point that the, you know, the, the introduction of money and gold and silver and placing quantitative values on property harms no one. Rather, it dictates that property that would remain undeveloped will become developed. That's the message that he concludes his chapter with. I, I, but I think we've kind of put paid to all that in the last I, 15 I, exactly. minutes. Haven't we? I think that's what we've done. I mean, we've we've taken the implications of what he said. So the question is, should he himself have been able to envision these these conditions and I, you know and I think I think that's I think that's too far to go I think we can I think we can certainly indict him for failure to take in indigenous people uh, into account because he had knowledge right but I, I you know it's kind of like it's kind of like talking about the framers in the Second Amendment yeah uh, go go and ask uh, go and ask Thomas Jefferson if a man should be able to carry around or possess a weapon that will shoot a hundred rounds in ten seconds. Right, right, right. I think, I, I, and I think it becomes pretty clear the answer you get. Exactly. And yeah. I don't think it was. I don't think it was comprehensible uh, that 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 we would have the technology to blow up entire mountains. Now there was certainly coal mining going on in England by by Locke's right. time. Right. And 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 frankly. Uh, I, to that extent, I think he can be indicted on that count as well, because he is chargeable with knowledge of what underground coal mining was doing in Wales. Right. Bob, there's one other thing, and because people will, in, in justification for this, people will always say it's really not fair to impose today's standards on people who lived in, you know, you know, be, in, in a different era. And I, I've heard people use that to justify Jefferson uh, challenges, arguments of racism about Jefferson and and all the rest of it. And and so when you said that, you know, about Locke, he could be indicted for not taking consideration of the indigenous peoples. And one could one could say in response to that, well, nobody at that time considered the welfare of indigenous peoples, which is true. But on the other hand, if anybody was going to begin, it would have been Locke. You know, well, and, Locke, and, and, and Locke I, wasn't your average person. Locke was the one. Uh, Locke was in a position to dictate what kinds of considerations and kinds of issues people were willing to take into consideration. So he was a leader of public opinion. He wasn't a follower of it. He was. So a, he was a public. He was. A, he was what we would call a public intellectual. So you can't allow him to escape. By no, and, and particularly, uh, particularly, uh, just by comparison. Okay. Um, let's take one of my ancestors who uh, rode in the 19th century, rode up and down Appalachia, preaching that slavery was the natural order that was ordained by God. And since he was a preacher, he was relying upon Holy Scripture, mm -hmm. where in, which, in which Paul advises slaves obey your master as we obey God. Yes. Okay. So I'm not, I'm not, I'm, I'm not cutting him any slack. I think it's disgusting. Yeah, but I understand him within the context of his times because he was not the only man making that argument. Oh. He was also not m making an argument as a futurist. I think we can place Locke in the realm of futurists. Yeah, because he is dealing with the future. He's dealing with the beginning of capital, the beginnings of capitalism, and he's justifying the potential of capitalism a a a as the world transitions from one one form of life to another. But he's he's so he's he's in the business of the future. But as you point out, it, it you know, he 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 doesn't allow himself to go far enough into the future to see the long term implications of what he's proposing. Well, I, I, I think I think there is I think there is some privilege involved there. And it is white privilege. OK, OK, uh, because because all of this is in the context of 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 white people uh, improving property. 
I mean, I, I think you could put the word white in, in, you know, in, in front of the word improvement any time that it appears in that text. Oh, yeah. Well, that's yeah, exactly. I mean, yeah, he's not he's, he's not talking about he's not talking about any 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 Sikhs or Hindus improving improving property no. on the subcontinent. No, 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 he's not. Oh, my. So, oh. I mean, it, yeah, but but I think he comes in for I think he I think he makes himself uh, uh, available for particular scrutiny because he is particularly engaged in not suggesting how things are, but how they ought to be. Mm -hmm. And basically, he's, sp he's, he's assuming the role as spokesman for the people who are going to bring that about. Exactly. And they are, I, I, they I have, are white, have, white capitalists. I have so hijacked your program. I am so no, you, sorry. Hey, yeah. Bob, I love it. Are you kidding me? I th this is fabulous. <laughs> it is fabulous. Listen, let's, uh, we're at 10 minutes after. Let's take a break. Come back at 15 after. Uh, you're listening to the Virtual Center for the Study of the Constitution and Civic Responsibility. It's 10 minutes after the hour. We're going to pause and take a five-minute break. We'll be right back, and then we'll, we'll continue with the last 45 minutes of our program. Please stay tuned. We now return to the Virtual Center for the Study of the Constitution and Civic Responsibility. Here again is Dr. Bill O'Brien. And, uh, Dr. Bill, you are joined by Horst. Oh, great. Thank you, Bob. I appreciate it so much. How are we doing, my friend? Hey, Dr. Bill. How's it going? It's going great. Thank you. Oh, terrific. Well, I heard someone say something about hijacking the program, so I thought that was probably a cue for me to call That, that was a cue. Yeah, yeah. Bob, <laughs> thinks he did. Bob thinks he did, and he adds so much to it. But as long as he doesn't know he does, uh, oh, he'll, well. keep, he'll, he'll keep calling. Otherwise, he'll, Best kind, he'll, right? otherwise he'll charge me. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> So right. how you yeah well, I, how you doing? I'm doing pretty well. I <clears throat> still kind of settling in back and forth between a, one new job and an old job, and kind of phasing, you know, yeah, moving from one to the other, and getting towards the through the holiday season. That's you know doesn't mean quite so much here locally. Right. And, uh, right. <clears throat> it's so been a will the will the new year? I mean, will will things change with the new year, or or does the the transition you're going through going to take longer than the first of the year um from what i understand i think i'll have an i'll, I'll have a pretty firm footing uh sometime in the new year like in january great uh, my schedule is already changing it has not solidified quite yet but it's getting pretty close uh -huh. but in terms of like this has implications on all kinds of things, like what time I get to go to bed and what time I wake up and stuff like that. So, well, you know, it, minor, it takes a while to things. settle into that. Minor things, minor things. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just yeah, little yeah. stuff, you know. Yeah, yeah. But. <laughs> well, I, you know, I, I, I guess when uh, if you uh, if you sought to hijack the pro the program, it's for a reason, and I, I give it. It's it, you know, it, it's 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 your call. Yeah. Well. Okay. Uh, it's it's for a reason. It's a uh, uh, maybe not quite what I would have hoped for. I I, I followed along the Mondays and yesterday's program uh, on lock uh, pretty well, and I meant to uh, to get started off. I I don't like calling into the in, into the show and, and and saying I don't know what's going on, but I kind of missed like a, a a fair portion of the first hour. So okay, <clears throat> I, I I walked into it like in the last fifteen minutes of your and Bob's discussion, right. so I kind of got but, an idea where, where you guys were going. Well, it was uh, actually it was actually. Um, uh, quite quite a, a an extensive discussion, and it was really the, it's been the highlight of the program. No, uh, yeah, and I look I look forward to go diving back into it in more detail for sure. Yeah, um, I mean, uh, because what, what basically I mean, let me let me share with you what what, what you know what 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 it was. Um, mm -hmm. Bob, Bob raised the point, and he was very concerned about Locke's failure to consider the indigenous peoples, and he was his concern was the whole idea of community was best reflected in the indigenous peoples that were in some of the uh, less developed portions of the world. And that Locke, you know, if Locke really was concerned or interested about community, um, he, he would have been much more sensitive to the welfare and the cultures of the indigenous peoples that were being displaced or overwhelmed by this expansive capitalism that Locke is is justifying and that's kind of what we were talking about we were basically discussing whether in fact it, it's fair to to indict Locke for uh, you know on on 
on contemporary standards uh, that weren't at play when when he wrote. And and of course, what we were talking about, as Bob pointed out, I think you probably heard this part, is that Locke was a futurist. I mean, he he his whole yeah. His whole life was spent in dealing with speculations about the future. So therefore, it's not unfair to expect him to have considered some of the negatives of the future as well as positives. Well, or just to completely fail to have foreseen, you know, the developments yeah. of the next 50 to 100 years. I mean, like, exactly. I, I, did, I did catch that, you know, yeah, at, at yeah. the outset of the, the, the emergence of the new middle class, the, the, the pres- professional class in the capitalist system that, that, that just – yeah, of course. Who 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 could know where that was going to go? I mean, like yeah. we're, we we still don't really have a good handle on. It. I mean, like no. I guess you know, <clears throat> theor- some theorists do, you know. But, uh, but well, I mean, lock the- lock ends this chapter, and 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 you know, I mean, and I I I I really have a pro- I really have a problem with this because he ends this chapter with the idea that money has provided it, money changes the whole situation is what he's basically saying. Right. And and is, is, and and he makes the point that one of the positives of the introduction of money is that it makes it possible to accumulate to to appropriate more property than you need because you can assign a fixed value to it. You can sell it for gold and silver. Gold and silver doesn't spoil. It just sits there. And so basically his argument is that the accumulation of more property than one needs, given the introduction of money, is not the problem that it was before money. But the fact of the matter is, obviously, it you know, obviously we know it is. I mean, the the inequality and his argument in the last paragraph of his chapter, he he acknowledges that the existence of inequality, which will emerge, which emerges as a result of this introduction of money, but he doesn't take the issue of inequality anywhere. And I. You know, I mean, and what, if you project into the future with the existing inequality, then you, he would have anticipated exactly where we are now, which which is really a problem. Well, tell me this in, in, in the historical scale of these things. I mean, like, obviously, money must was was certainly surely no innovation to, to you know, to lock. I mean, like, I'm sure that, that, that it, it existed well before his time. Right. Mm-hmm. But maybe but what, what might have been more of an innovation is the, is the fungibility of, of uh, real estate. Mm-hmm. Like you were saying, like around this time, like the, the, there was a shift between, you know, uh, land as something you could actually buy and sell as opposed to something you had. It was part of your title and just part right. of who you were. Exactly. Right? That's that's an important consideration. Right. And so the right there is like the, the, we start to see a, a dividing line develop between a difference between property and real estate per se. You know, money um, – <clears throat> When when the acquisition of when the new world opens up and people are acquiring new lands and and the idea of actually amassing you know uh, real estate property and and exchanging that in terms of monetary value and then also I mean resource exploitation you know and mining new actual precious mm-hmm. metals and things I suppose I mean like all that could kind of go together again it's it's kind of a new thing yeah. Um, what what occurred to me like what what you were just setting that up though is like in in, in some respects you know <clears throat> uh, and I'm trying to get my dates straight here but in a lot of ways it seems to me that Thomas Jefferson kind of uh, represents a somewhat of an intersection between like a Lockean kind of uh, point of view with a firsthand knowledge of, of native lifestyles, indigenous peoples in the New World, right? I mean, that's, because that's he grew a, up, that, that's a he grew up point. among yeah. amongst the tribal people, and he had all oh. he had all, the, the best of both worlds, right? He had like the the the, the, the full oh, yeah. Western he, canon and, and 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 all that training, and at the same time, he also grew up, you know, with the tribal people speaking their one at least one language, right? That uh, right. And not only that, but you know, he studied indigenous peoples. Right. Yeah. Sure. I mean, uh, his uh, the notes on the Confederacy, his, right, was a big thing for him, right? And, oh yeah, and his notes on the yeah. state of Virginia. I mean, he writes extensively about about native cultures and religion and 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 marriage. Uh, you know, uh, uh, ch- raising children and all. Of, I mean, he really is into indigenous. I mean, he sees it. He sees it as fascinating. Well, and, that to me is like just like taking the locks. You know, of. Uh, uh, theories and, and and actually getting to put that on the ground you know with his own personal experience growing up because i'm sure you know he must have thought about this many times in, oh, yeah. <laughs> in his own yeah right? yeah yeah oh yeah 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 you know uh, there's one other thing that you mentioned that um that that that, that clicks 
something in my mind that I, I think is important here too. When you raise the question about the, the change in the nature of property from oh, yeah. from property as a symbol of status to property as an you know as a commodity that you can sell for profit. Um, and, and, and when you mentioned that, I was think I, I was putting it in the in Locke's situation, and I thought, you know, if he's defending the idea of accumulating more property that it can you, you can use with the idea that you can sell it and thereby see it that it's um, developed, even if you don't develop it yourself, then in effect, what he's I'm, I've, uh, he mentions inequality. What he's talking about here is he's acknowledging the reality of a cl the the impending reality of a class system, and he's not challenging it. He's accepting it because obviously the people who would purchase the portions of land that these land accumulators would would put up for sale would would not be in the same category as the others. So in a sense, he's he's acknowledging. The fact that capitalism, by definition, is going to create a a class system. Well, and again, I, I I'm I'm kind of led to ask myself, as I am when I when I read uh, Hamilton and Madison in the Federalist Papers discussing you know our uh, our distinguished betters. I, I can't remember exactly what the phrase is, but like I wonder if because as you mentioned uh, the other day that Locke is is his historical context is justifying the glorious revolution. Mm -hmm. And I wonder if he's not playing to his crowd a little bit too with that. I mean, he's he is to some extent his bread. And, I mean, if you look at the people prior to him, like they 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 earned their living, you know, uh, as as Bob called them, uh, uh, public intellectuals used to earn their living by uh, by a royal uh, uh, what is it uh, uh, um, patronage. Patronage, Pat yes, patronage. yeah, right. They're yeah. on a patronage system, and then somewhere right. after that, you get into like an, on a on a subscription system, you know, or you know. It, 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 there's there's different ways that that, that a that a public intellectual can earn his pay, and so, and or you know, and and you go a hundred years, a hundred two hundred years later, and look at Charles Dickens, who's who's literally you know getting paid by the word, <laughs> and, yeah, and you yeah. see it like, you 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 can you can have your 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 fine high minded opinions theories and stuff like that, but you still kind of have to remember where you you know, uh, where where your your paycheck's coming from, and right. I wonder if he's not adjusting. I don't. I don't know. I. I prefer to think that that there is some purity, uh, in in the the ideas, uh, that that he's ex, ex, expounding upon. But I right. I do wonder if it's not, you know, to some extent motivated by by some practical considerations like that. Right. Like, you know, he's 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 trying to keep in mind who who he's pitching this whole thing to. Yeah, I mean, you're you're right, and you know, I I had mentioned earlier that. Uh, uh, the, Locke's, Locke was particularly influential uh, in in his own time, but the irony of the situation is his influence wasn't driven by these treatises on government. His influence was pretty much established because of his essay on moral sentiments, and and you know that that and that was written earlier, and that really established his reputation, um, you, you know, as you know as somebody who's Whose ideas and thoughts were something to take seriously, and he was his reputation was built on on his essay and moral sentiments, not the essay, not the treatises on civil government. So that's and also human understanding, right? That was another. Was uh, they, that before or after government? Oh, wait a minute. Uh, that's right. The the, the moral understanding. Oh, moral me. sentiments. That, that's Adam no, Smith. The moral spenders. Adam Smith. Yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah, it's yeah. on human understanding. Yeah, that's it's human the, understanding. Yeah. Right. Right, right. And right. I mean, this is the this is the the tabula rasa idea and how man learns and how you know how man's behavior is you know is is determined by environment and all the, all the other things and and uh, that's what really establishes Locke's reputation. And I, and I think it's important to mention that because those people that focus their attention on the second treatises uh, tend to assume that Locke's influence because of those treatises is something we need to take very seriously. But in fact, that those treatises were not the basis of his reputation. OK, so you're so you're suggesting possibly that, that by the time he, he got to write the treatises on the on um, uh, the, the first and second treatises that, that he'd already kind of. Uh, 
he had he, a reputation. Uh, he, he'd already paid his dues. He could. He, yeah. he had a free hand to write what what he really thought. Right? And he he had a, mm-hmm. he had a reputation. Now now whether and I mean and he there's no question he was uh, uh, you know he was advocating the interests of the emerging middle classes in London and and Liverpool and those places. Um, the you know and they, these were the people that were investing in the overseas explorations and all the rest of it. I mean he saw them as as England's future. And, right, and, a, and not to be too cynical about it. I mean, like he could have he could have seen that emerging and, and been really completely caught up and excited about the whole thing. Oh, I'm that sure he was. The understandable reaction. Yeah, um, I'm sure he was. Yeah. And you know, and 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 Bob's you know, um, uh, you know, Bob's real concern is is about the indigenous peoples, and I can understand that. But the fact of the matter is, these people believe that they were the the first wave of civilization. And that they were in the process of civilizing the world. And, yeah, it's, a, it's it's in other words, it's it's, a, it's an evangelical uh, mission, but yeah, and and so therefore, in, in a more of a in a humanist kind of uh, divine order, uh, and more like the, the the rational enlightenment revolution as opposed to um, yeah, a, a more of a, a traditional a religious, uh, overtly religiously driven uh, mission. So, so therefore, there they, they would understandably not be any respect for the cultural traditions of the indigenous peoples because these people would actually believe that they were bringing civilization to people that didn't have it. Right, or that they could at least tell themselves that, you know. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> while and they, they I mean, it. and they, they did. I mean, they, they you know, right. they, oh, sure. they pondered up all these arguments about, about saving souls and bringing you know souls to Christ and all this other Let's stuff get the white man's burden and and that's and and that's what of course that's what the evangelicals today point to as justification for the fact that we're a Christian nation is that right. there's so much mention of God in these in, in in amongst these explorers but as much as anything else it's a justification for what they're doing not a reason i mean i'm right. sure that the missionaries that include that were included in some of these uh some of these exp- exploration groups that for them, the the conversion of, uh, you know, to to the word bringing the word of God was was what they were about. But that wasn't what the whole operation was about. It was basically a money making operation. I mean, it was a it was a joint stock company, and people invested right. in it to make pro- and bought stock to make profit. And the profit. I think the was, sense of mission maybe of how how they convinced the people on the ground to actually carry out their their mission was zeal. Yeah. You know, the money yeah. is, of course is flowing up. Way upstairs, you know. Oh yeah. To people they're, they're who are not, not nowhere near that. Right? No, exactly. Right, right, and right. We we see that at play in play in our in our uh, in our politics today. I mean, like it's, I just it's, it's something that made me flash on like the whole, <clears throat> you know, the current mess with uh, police brutality and and uh-huh. uh, how how we handle our low income neighborhoods and stuff like that as as though that these people somehow they require such a heavy hand because they just can't help themselves and it just so happens that you know by creating these zones of of low income and you know we we can we can we can enable the continuance of a of a of a of a broad you know income gap and it, yeah. it, it's 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 a similar dynamic you know yeah. played out on, on on larger or smaller scales right. you know throughout history and, right. and it kind of works the same way the people in charge of it have you know the people who set the policy you know they 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 claim a certain ideal and they may or may not believe in it. You know, mm-hmm. it, it almost doesn't even matter. But the people who are on the ground, that's what they tell themselves that, that they get them through the day, I guess, as right. they as they carry out the, <laughs> the brutal work. Gets them through the day, yeah, yeah. Right. Well, I mean, I mean, you read some of the uh, some of the literature, especially some of these uh, missionaries that were involved in the Spanish um, uh, colonization of Central America, and the brutality with which. The Indians were treated, and Las Casas, and some of these, um, yeah. uh, you know, some of the, some of these folks. I mean, I mean, they were appalled by the treatment of the native of the native populations. So uh, I, it seems to me that that uh, uh, you know, it's not until the actual clash takes place between between the different cultures that the brutality of the entire situation uh, becomes evident to many of these people. I. I think you know. I I know when I used to teach this, I would I, you know this this clash of cultures. You know, if 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 you have two cultures that clash, you know, it seems right. three things can happen. One culture will overwhelm the the other. The, yeah, one way or the other. So one way or the things, other. Right? Or there will be a new culture that will emerge out of the mixing of the two. 
and and that implies uh, that both cultures accept something of the legitimacy of the others, and that's not true. You know, I mean, the West, no. Western cultures accepted nothing in these indigenous cultures as being legitimate. And so, consequently, of the three options, only one could prevail, and it did. And that was the, the absolute... One gets wiped out. The absolute destruction of these indigenous cultures. These indigenous peoples, with some some measure of assimilation, uh, you know, but but you know, it, it, yeah, more, be... more so more so in, in uh, yeah. you know in in the uh, in Central and South America than in North right. America. Uh, the English hold a pro, and, and it's part of the settlement. I mean, the the Spanish were were looking for gold and silver. They were ec- extracting wealth, natural wealth, yeah. and so they basically uh, it became very obvious that the that the natives. As a as a work as a source of labor, was the best use of the native population. The English, on the other hand, were sending large groups of settlers over here who needed to fence off and develop land. So for them, the Indians had to be pushed out of the way, not assimilated. And so the whole English approach to dealing with the Indians is driven by the nature of the colonial experience. And and uh, so it's very interesting if you look at the at the way the Spanish, the French, and the English all dealt with the native populations, you begin to see significant differences. And it's all driven by the nature of the wealth that was anticipated to be there. You know, it's fascinating. Um, the, the, the French um, in Canada, for example, uh, the French uh, were much, developed a much closer working relationship with the Indians than anything else because the wealth coming out of Canada was predominantly in furs. And if the if the wealth, the profit coming out of Canada was to be in furs, then you needed the Indians because the Indians were the were the hunters. They were the, you know, they were the ones that could that could could actually gather, recover the wealth. So you had to have a good re- working relationship with them uh, in order to exploit the wealth of the area. So each area is different, a different kind of wealth. And it d- dictates a different kind of treatment of the indigenous populations. But all of it en- ends up destroying those populations because nothing in their cultures is considered to be legitimate enough to assimilate into your own. You know, I mean, that- and, and whatever they have is they don't have the, uh, the organizational capacity to, uh, to resist. Repel the uh, yeah no and and I think in Latin America they tried to you know some of these some of these groups the Aztecs for example uh, tried to resist and 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 resistance really really got the big dogs angry you know I mean they yeah. they, they they came full for they brought out the ATMs and uh, you know the the, uh, uh, the assault weapons and stuff uh, you know with that so uh, anyway it's it's a it's a fascinating story, but it's one that I think I, a Bob comment earlier. Um, it's a sto- it's a story that needs to be told. People need to hear you know need to hear this stuff because it it you know it's so easy to ignore, overlook uh, you know just you know I mean that uh, and, and and you can't because we're continually doing the same thing. I mean you mentioned the situation with the police brutality in our cities right now we're going through the same kind of thing now and you know and if we if we haven't if we haven't learned more from what happened before it's our fault no i I, I could look back at like you know the pre-civil war period and and look at the build-up to the that that um you know catastrophe and i can cut those people some slack for not knowing what was coming yeah but what what excuse do we have yeah, I mean <laughs> everything yeah. that we everything that we we have uh, happening right now has, has is just a replay of of a, of, a, of a of a of a history that that is not only like tired beyond belief, but you know the evidence the the records of which are at our all of our fingertips. Anytime we yeah. any, any 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 anytime any any individual one of us wants to get it, we we have access to this. Right. It's but it's yeah. it's it's discomforting to a lot of people. They'd rather not know it, I think. Yeah, well, no, I I don't know if yeah, well there's that. Yeah. Um yeah, it's a complicated picture. I think I think probably the number one thing is I think everyone's just, you know, worked to a point where they don't have the time or the energy or the patience to to actually do real mental work. Yeah. Uh and you know, and you have to have a certain amount of leisure just to even find 
things like history interesting. Um, Great point. Or, <clears throat> or educational, any kind of thing. I mean, like I think that's that's one of the the things that that the uh, the framers were were kind of struggling with trying to figure out. Like back in the in the early days of the revolution, like you know, there was the belief that this kind of wisdom, this basic, you know, whether your education was at a high level or a low level, that that people had an innate ability to 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 make some basic judgments about right or wrong, um, a common sense kind of a thing. But um, but as as time progressed, they they kind of realized that you know some people just really <laughs> don't don't, don't seem have, to have the capacity for that. It's, it's, yeah. it, and, and they didn't know, they couldn't figure out. I mean, they they they, they realized there is a correlation, you know, to some extent, a uh, judgment and higher cognitive development is to a to a large degree is is a product of of privilege. It is. I mean, you have to have leisure and and time to reflect. And th- and think about and process and take in your experience as you go along through life. And the people who are just who are working their fingers to the bone day in and day out don't really, you know, unless they're doing a, a kind of work that that allows them to, to to ruminate while they're you know mentally while they're doing you know physical labor, they're not going to do that. Right. Most people right. are like in a, in a in a different world. So so these things kind of go together. Well, you know, it's it, it, you you you're striking a, a chord with me because in my own situation, it's that's quite true. Uh, I, you know, I, I I I've been involved in this stuff for half a century, but sure, fact, no, but as as, as, that, as an educator on the front lines, you you know what this is. I mean, like, but, yeah, except that except that what I could get into and the depth that I could get into it was limited because I had a job. Right. And ultimately, that had to come first. And and so what I've noticed here at the at, since we've been doing these programs is that because I'm retired, I mean I can get in. It drives my wife crazy. <laughs> I, I mean I can get in here and I, I mean I'll sit. Uh, honest to God, I mean uh, my brother was laughing at me on the phone last night at this, but it's absolutely true. I mean this Saturday afternoon two weeks ago, she, she my wife yelled in and said, "What are you doing?" And I said, "I'm reading Euclid." <laughs> You know, I mean, and I and I. And she said, I, "I knew it." <laughs> I walked out into the kitchen and I said, "I've got to be the only person on the face of the earth on a Saturday afternoon in December that's reading Euclid." You know, right. and uh, but but you're right. And the fact of the matter is, the depth that I've been able to uh, to get into some of this writing and Locke and and Madison and some of the others is based on the fact that I've retired. Yeah, there's a balance between leisure and complacency, I guess. And, and yeah, yeah, and I, I mean, that's my, that's my fear. I mean, I'm, I'm so afraid. Well, that's, the, that's the thing. That's what happens to most people when they retire. They just get like, okay, well, I guess I did it then. And yeah, you know, that's thing, it. You know, you're, you're, I'm you're so afraid of that. Too long. So I, and, yeah, I, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm, pu- I'm trying to push myself because I feel as long as I can, I need to, you know. Right. And, uh, but uh, anyway. You know what I mean, but you're right. I mean, what you're saying is exactly right, and it's ironic. That's what the slave owners in the South used to used to use to justify slavery as a positive oh, institution. Right. Yeah. Culture. Well, if, if if they weren't, you know, <laughs> operating our plantations, and what would they get I, up to? You know, and right. the whole the whole idea was that you know it was the Southern leisure class that yeah. that made the breakthroughs that created progress. In man's standard of living, and therefore slavery made it possible for that to happen. It, it slavery w- was was necessary because it provided the leisure to those people who were going to create progress, who were going to make progress happen. So I mean that's I mean, it's a fantastic argument, but that's that's one of the ones they made. Mm-hmm. And uh, the irony is there's kind of a legitimacy to it because leisure is definitely a part of this. There's no question. Well, if you look at the graph of history also, uh, just exploitation of, of energy sources, that's another uh, – and you know, slavery is what you would use for, for cheap energy before you, know, you found out what you can do with coal and steam power and stuff like that, which is what, what was the next phase. Yeah. Yeah. It, it, slavery is like the, the step right before industrialization, and once industrialization takes place, yes, productivity goes through the roof. And and yeah, the, uh, so yeah, I guess there there may be something to that, but yeah, in itself, it's it's a pretty <laughs> yeah, it's 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 pretty weak tea. But it's, yeah, it's pretty, I know I understand exactly what you're saying. Yeah, 
yeah, it's a little bit it's a little bit hard to justify. But there's that there's definitely. I mean, I know in my own case, I I found it to be well. Justification because, is usually retrospective. It's like, oh, we're gonna we're gonna do it first, and then we're gonna figure out how it's okay. You know? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> now, that, now that we're comfortable, here's here's why we should be here, and, and yeah. why we don't need to change yeah, anything. Yeah. And that's yeah. that's that's pretty much the story of history, right yeah. there, isn't it? <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so. Yeah. Well, well interestingly, oh, yeah, I, I called in. I, I, number one, I just wanted to uh, get one last call in while 2015 was still 2015. Okay. Because as I, as I get it, you know, next next time it'll be next year. So it'll be next year, yeah. And I may or may not be able to do it for a while. So yeah. you never know. I mean, these, yeah, I know. these are kind of hit or miss things. Number one, and number two, I did, I had one little observation to drop that had nothing to do with anything except the, the fact that we we're like on the subject of John Locke and stuff, which, which I've been meaning to, to put in. At some point, so I thought, you know, today would be as good a day as any. But sure, it occurred to me like one of the things I really enjoy about studying or reading the the uh, the primary sources of this time period, and and Locke is a little bit beforehand, and yeah. you know, and got, you know, any anywhere between the 17th and the, maybe the 19th century, right? Early 20th, maybe. You're like uh, a couple of years ago. I just happened to. to uh, well ahead of before you picked up Adam and Smith and the whole discussion of the uh, Scottish Revolution thing, I had I had wanted to I've been telling myself for about five years I wanted to, to read the Wealth of Nations to uh -huh. just just know it firsthand, mm -hmm. and I got to researching it and I read some remarks that you really don't understand the Wealth of Nations unless you unless you first get yourself familiar with the essay on moral understanding. So so I dug that up, <clears throat> uh -huh. and I was reading that. In the car, and I think in a period of about two and a half hours, I got through maybe six pages. Uh -huh. and, and it's not because the, the the text was too dense or it was it was really impenetrable. You know, I've got a I've got an English literature degree. I'm I'm very comfortable with things like uh, you know, I can I can read Chaucer and I can do all that. I can't pronounce yeah. it correctly like Bob can, but I can understand it. You know, yeah, <laughs> I, I get through that no problem. Oh, um, but I was I, I would I would read like a sentence and a half. And I would have to put the book down because my head's swimming like, oh my god! Yeah. It just it, like every every thing, every single sentence that he would say, like, and, and this is like in the first couple of chapters, sure. it, it would just send me spinning off all kinds of directions. It, it felt like I could just really understand, dive deep into the meaning, and extract out of everything. And it got uh -huh. me thinking. It's like it seems that there's something deeply satisfying about reading uh, someone who's writing from the perspective of that. That early enlightenment, you know, uh, yep. mentality. I know, know what you. I know what you're saying. Yeah, where I, they're they're writing from a point of view where the universe and everything that happens in life is comprehensible by a single person. You know, mm -hmm. if you just if you can sit down and follow it, yeah. they're not. It, this is like pre-specialization. This is even before sciences as such. I mean, like, you know, back when physics was still um, natural philosophy. Mm -hmm. Everything was philosophy, you know. So if you're a person of some education, you could pick up a treatise by the most learned person on, on in any particular, you know, uh, 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 what do you call it? <laughs> discipline. Discipline on any yeah. particular discipline, and you can. And if you if you sit and and just you know sit with the language slowly and read through it, right? You can you can comprehend. You can take it in if you. You know, if you have to run for the dictionary every now and then, that's that, that's not going to hurt anybody. But you can do it. Mm -hmm. You know, and it's very satisfying. in at the age, especially from from someone who, you know, who's who's used to the, the world now, where everything is so compartmentalized and so specialized, where no one is an expert on anything. All right, um, right. It's so hard for me to even even call in and talk to you and and, and express an opinion on something because I know. <laughs> Whatever it is I have to say about something, I know I'm going to be wrong. You know, I've got my facts backwards. I'm and and or there's something, some crucial bit of information I'm missing. But I just have this idea. It's like I've got to tease yeah. this out. What if it's this way? You know, and I got to ask. Yeah. I got to ask Doctor Bill's like, is, is this right? And like, I'll find out of it. You know, and that'll be like, no, good lord, there was so much. No, <laughs> so much it's not true though. I, was I mean, missing. usually there's something mo very, very substantive to what, and that's the whole point, I think. No, no, well, the interchange in, in in the exchange, something valuable can come out of that. But oh my like god! It, I always yeah, I always come no. in like with with a thesis that's comp well, and, and no, and I don't I don't mean to take it that direction. I'm just saying like, this is I think this this, this creates an insecurity that that we all deal with. 
Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, you nobody know, nobody really feels solid on their own on their on their own ground with anything anymore. And well, one of, that one was of the things. Like the, yeah. Go ahead. I was just going to say one of the things that you that 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 w- you mentioned, which is very valid, is that those people wrote for the general public. They didn't just write for a very small group of professionals who had degrees and and therefore were privileged to read it. They wrote for the general, I mean, the educated public, the people who read and uh, who read and thought and those kinds of things. But so they, so therefore they weren't trying to confuse people. They were trying to explain and reason. You know, they were trying to basically go through a reasoning process as things seem to make sense to them. And if you allow it, if you get into it, you're right. I do the same thing. I read, it takes me, uh, you know, this chapter of, uh, of locks on property. Uh, I printed it out uh, from the internet. It's eight page, eight seven and a half pages. It took me eight hours to read those seven and a half pages because there's so much in them, in those pages. I mean, it's just like you say, every sentence says something. Yeah, I feel like I'm reading an entire book, you know, in oh the space God. of a page, or I can and, just, I can write my own. You know. And that's and, and of course it's interesting because th- that's really what Plato said that that all of us have this innate we do we all can understand if we just give ourselves the time and the credit to to take it on and do it. I mean, the, what makes these guys great is that they've got so much to say, you know, and it's it's so rich. And when you think about it, your mind goes in nine different directions and. And, and, and I mean, we learn from these people because they they have so much to say. It's fantastic. Yeah. And mm-hmm. and as, as you and Bob were mentioning or uh, or as, as came up in your discussion, the whole it's like you said, as a university professor who is actually teaching, you were saying that you, that you actually felt feel now by comparison that you have more access to the information and than you did when you were actually dealing with it. That's right. That's <laughs> in right. In a That's classroom right. situation, because, and I was thinking, so it, in a classroom situation, it's like I have my classes, and we have a curriculum that, that's that's set up by semesters, and you know, every day you've got to cover a certain number yep. of lessons or units or something like that, and the whole thing is is more or less subdivided to a point that that you have to stay on a kind of a schedule, mm-hmm. and if it, when you get down to like the public school system, like elementary and high school. It's 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 so much that if you miss a day because of weather, you have to take an extra day because that because the the, the semester is, is subdivided so precisely mm-hmm. that you've got to make up that day because that material is lost. I mean, could you imagine if you could just give a teacher, a competent teacher, a certain amount of you know skills that they have to guide yeah. a, a class through in a given period of time? They say, okay, I got it. I'm going to do it my way. Yeah, and they're 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 capable of doing that. And I got to thinking, it's like it reminds me of of, of reading again, like uh, Plato or Socrates, it's like a symposium system as opposed to university, where like you, you read Socrates, you look, you, you read the Republic, uh, Plato rather, uh, mm-hmm. and these these students, these people, student and teacher, they're together day and night. Yeah. <laughs> you know, they talk yeah. about these things in class, and they hang out and they, and they drink wine and discuss it. You know, for hours on end. You know, <laughs> that's right. That's Can right. Can you imagine the, the amount of education you could get with that? <laughs> well, in, I, in I, when I went and when I when I went to because I went to, when I went to college, I went to a commuter college. It was a teacher's college, and it was just like high school. In fact, it, it was ironic because my the college I went to was right across the street from the high school I graduated from, and. Um, but I, I might go in in the morning and take classes and go home in the evening and all that. And so and I went through college that way. And when I went to graduate school, I, you know, I, I was I was a resident student and I lived in the in the in a graduate dorm for the first year. And we used to have these we go out and drink beer and uh, all night long and talk about, you know, talk about all of this stuff. And I when I think back on it, I said, my God, I, I there's no way I could you, you could learn Anywhere near that much in a commuter situation, you know. I mean, there's no, uh, it's unbelievable. No, and, and imagine if your teacher were there with you while you were doing this too. Yeah, I mean, like that's the other thing. And they thing. did. And I, uh, my, uh, my my wife's son um, uh, just he completed a uh, uh, a degree from Duke University in uh, engineering in engineering management this past mm-hmm. year, and but it was one of those things where it was a distance it was a distance degree. And they would have they would have uh, uh, periods like in the uh, 
in the summertime, they would they would go to Duke and they would be housed in the dorms for like five weeks. And they would come from the students that were enrolled. They would come from all over the world. And that for, for five weeks, they would be there. And he he was emailing back and telling us that, you know, that the profess every night they had a dinner. Uh, they had dinner with a different one of their professors. Hmm. I mean, he would join them in the dining hall and they would sit there for hours over the uh, over dinner. And talk about the stuff that they were talking about in class. And he said, it, "It's abs- I, I never experienced a learning environment like that in my life. It's unbelievable how much you learn." Yeah, you know, that I mean, you, ideal. It, it absolutely was, and, and it's it's absolutely unbelievable. And when we went to the, to his graduation in May, um, the speaker at the graduate, who was the dean of that particular school of engineering, uh, she made it was a woman, and she made the point. That these students, because of this degree experience and the residential experience that they had built into it, these students will will be friends for the rest of their lives. I mean, and they're from oh. all over the world. Yeah, no question. And that's, they, I mean, and and yeah. and David and we were up there at Christmas time um, in New England, and David was talking about the fact that he had been hearing from this student and that student, and they keep up with each other, and they, you know, and one of them, they're in Japan, they're in China, they're in, in you know, uh, Yugoslavia, they're, they're everywhere, you know, and it's, it's absolutely amazing, and it's the ideal educational setting, but how many people can afford to to no. do that. Well, yeah. yeah. I mean, that's the whole. Like I, I have a handful of friends like that myself, but we're all from different disciplines. I mean, I, I'm just trying to imagine what it would have been like if everybody that was in the same degree track oh, that I was God, in had yeah. that kind of access to each other. I mean, that's mind blowing. How, I can, how I mean, great we, would that be? I can remember sitting in, in, you know, in 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 the dorm, and literally the sun would come up. Right. Yeah. And we'd be sitting there all night long, for God's sake. Sure. It was absolutely it was, because it was so exciting. It was, it was so, so <laughs> you know, yeah. it was just amazing. I had never experienced anything like it in my life. And, right. and well, you know, and, and uh, well, listen, uh, it's yeah, wonderful, wonderful you hearing from you. Yeah, I got about two couple of minutes left here before yeah, we, yeah. I'm, before I'm we gonna sign off and, and, and get out before. I'm going to I'm going to say so. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm going to say today. Uh, thanks for joining us and we'll see you next year. <laughs> All righty. We'll, we'll see you next yeah. year, Dr. Bill. Thanks. Thanks, Horst. Thank I appreciate it so much. Happy New Bye. Year to you. You too. Thank Bye. you. OK. Uh, we are at 56 minutes after the hour, and my God, wh- what can I say? What an experience! Um, there's no—I mean, I was ready. I was ready to go go full blast on luck today, but I swear, uh, conversation with Bob and then this half hour with Horst, fabulous, absolutely fabulous. So um, I, I just thoroughly enjoy it, and I I keep going back to in my mind to Bob's comment about. Uh, the, these kinds of conversations and how many, how often are they happening in other places? And and the fact that it is possible, we can see that it is possible to do this using technology, using the Internet. And in the back of my mind is an article that I saw in this morning's Charleston Gazette here in West Virginia, that two thirds of West Virginia students do not have access to broadband. Two thirds. How can the state possibly hope to move forward in today's world when two-thirds of the residents of West Virginia do not have access to broadband. It's unbelievable. And there's all of this money floating around. These, these communications companies are, you know, um, you know, people have all of these packages, uh, cable packages for phones and Internet service and television and 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 movie channels and all the rest of it. The fact of the matter is two thirds of West Virginia residents don't have access to broadband and that's the future. And I think what we've experienced here today at the virtual center is an indication of what the future of learning and education in this country will be as a result of technology. And I think it's very exciting and it's very, very challenging. And I, I feel privileged to be part of it. And I thank Bob and I thank Horst for joining us in today's in today's conversation. It is 58 minutes after the hour and it's time to sign off. And I, again, I don't mean to be facetious, of course, by saying we'll see you all next year. But next year ha- will happen to be this coming Monday, uh, the fourth day of January. 
uh, will be our next program. And I look forward. I hope that everybody has a wonderful New Year's uh, and a wonderful weekend to go with it. Uh, enjoy the bowl games. Enjoy whatever it is. Please be safe because, you know, we, I won't go through all that, but you know what I mean. Please be safe because we don't have that many listeners, regular listeners at the Head On Radio Network or here at the Virtual Center. We can't afford to lose any, so please take care of yourself and be careful. I want to thank you so very, very much for your time and your support and and your consideration of our programming. So thank you very much. Uh, We'll see you next Monday. Have a great weekend.